I've never played a series quite like The Legend of Heroes. Nihon Falcom, one of the longest-running game studios still in action, has delivered several brilliantly crafted, carefully interwoven narratives spanning multiple generations and platforms. For over a decade and a half, we've followed the stories of Liberal, Crossbell, and most recently, Erebonia. Now, after all the anticipation, all the Easter eggs, all the twists, and all the turns, our time in Erebonia is set to draw to a close. As always, this review is spoiler-free for Cold Steel 4. However, the game itself contains significant spoilers for its preceding entries. If you'd like to avoid these spoilers, this is your opportunity to click away. In the meantime, please subscribe and click the bell to get notified whenever I post new videos. I'll also annotate my previous Nihon Falcom content at the end of this video. Okay, if you're still here, I'll assume you're okay with whatever lies ahead. So let's get started. This is it. This is the conclusion to the journey of Class 7. This is the end of a saga. This is Trails of Cold Steel 4. Trails of Cold Steel 4 begins shortly after the climax of Cold Steel 3. Following Class 7's failed assault on the Grawl and the death of a number of important allies, the Ironbloods and Ouroboros have brought Erebonia to its knees beneath the supernatural weight of the Great Twilight. Our regular protagonist Reen has been captured, Class 7 is in hiding, and the Erebonian curse marches the Empire ever onward towards a devastating war with Calvert. Cold Steel 4's chief conflict is the culmination of a journey 16 years in the making, and delivers on what Cold Steel 3 foreshadowed in earnest. Several familiar faces rejoin the fray, bringing together the casts of Trails in the Sky, Trails from Azure and Zero, and of course, Trails of Cold Steel. The sheer amount of returning characters is honestly staggering, ranging from series protagonists to minor background NPCs. I'd be lying if I said I didn't geek out over the return of various fan-favorite cast members. Seeing beloved and despised personalities from years past interacting with one another, discovering what alliances were forged and broken over the years, and experiencing how it all culminates at the journey's climax. To say it was merely an immensely satisfying experience would be an injustice. For any curious newcomers that decided to keep watching, this is clearly not the best entry point into the series. You will be hard-pressed to follow Cold Steel 4's narrative if you don't have any prior knowledge of Western Zemiria's overarching tale. At the absolute barest minimum, you'll need to have played Cold Steel 3, and even that will leave you with several questions. I still recommend at least playing Cold Steel 1, 2, and 3 first. Cold Steel 4 is a game that improves exponentially relative to how much prior experience the player has with The Legend of Heroes, and series veterans like myself will certainly derive the most joy from this fourth entry. That's not to say it's a perfect story throughout even for series veterans. Admittedly, the opening act is tremendously slow, and there's the usual amount of meandering about in the middle portion of the game. But once the narrative gets going, it doesn't just ramp up. It launches like a rocket, and each beat is punctuated by a sizable exclamation point. I was extremely pleased with the time I spent in Cold Steel 4. It felt like something truly special. Performance-wise, there's nothing too different from Cold Steel 3 to Cold Steel 4. Everything looks and runs fine for the most part, and the quality of life improvements such as Turbo Mode and Auto Fast Forward have all been brought back. There are a few minor frame rate issues in the usual places, but these are again almost entirely mitigated by enabling Turbo. Actually, the frame rate in general is a lot better. There are oftentimes so many characters and objects clustered on screen, much like in Cold Steel 3. However, Cold Steel 4 handles these scenes much better than any of its predecessors. It's not highly impressive by modern graphical standards, but the series isn't known for its groundbreaking visuals. Within the vacuum of the Cold Steel subseries, the graphics and performance are more than sufficient. The localization is really the aspect with which I had the most concern. Due to the obvious topical real-world events, I was worried the localization wouldn't be as polished, especially given Nice America's spottier track record as of late, even before everyone began working remotely. 
And now that I've experienced it, I'm happy to say the localization is good, though it definitely has its flaws. A lot of glaring issues such as text errors and audio equalization issues have already been fixed thanks to a patch, but there are still the occasional problems that manage to slip through the cracks. None of it is ruinous, they are exceptionally minor, but it is a shame that they've not been completely quashed. Hopefully these will all get fixed in future updates. The voice acting is also much the same situation. Once again, I found Sean Chiplock to be excellent in his leading role. The way he's evolved his portrayal of Reen over the course of the series has been subtle and fantastic. Strangely enough, a few characters have been recast here in this finale. For what it's worth, the new voice actors do an admirable job in their roles. Rather than putting forth new interpretations of these long-established characters, each voice actor mirrors the performances of their respective predecessors, and it works fairly well. She's passed the baton to us. Now we must work together to protect what we hold dear. Reen has always devoted himself to helping others. We owe it to him to follow his example. It was definitely jarring at first, but after a while I got used to it. I wouldn't begrudge any opinion to the contrary, but it didn't detract from my enjoyment of the game in the slightest. Perhaps a more notable localization issue is the difference in audio equalization. Nothing sounds bad per se, but since most of the voice actors are working from home with their own personal equipment and not in studio, the EQ can vary between each character. For instance, Estelle Bright has a general flatness or hollowness in sound quality when compared to, say, Joshua Bright. Say what? Since when does the society just roll over like that? If that's the case, then what happened in Heimdall? It's not really a big deal though since it's pretty subtle, and you can't really blame anyone involved given the situation. So generally, while the localization has a few stumbles, it's completely understandable why, and the most glaring issues have already been fixed. I'm sure the lingering issues will eventually be remedied as well. The gameplay is fundamentally the same as Cold Steel 3. Combat is still a finely tuned series of balancing acts between various mechanics, and there are nearly 40 playable characters this time around, which is insane! First are crafts, the character-specific skills with a wide range of implementation. Using crafts costs CP, and CP is also used for the ultimate attacks known as S-crafts. Then there are arts, which are magic spells that cost EP and are gained by equipping normal and master quartz. Normal Quartz functions very similarly to Materia from Final Fantasy VII. You equip it to access Arts, Stat Boosts, and Bonus Effects. Master Quartz, on the other hand, bestow unique and inherent bonuses and skills and may be leveled up to improve these effects. You can set both a primary Master Quartz, which nets you all of that Master Quartz's benefits, as well as a sub-Master Quartz, which grants you a limited selection of benefits. Next are Brave Orders. These special commands temporarily buff your party in a variety of ways, and there's a much larger collection of orders to choose from in Cold Steel 4 due to the massive cast size. Along with Brave Orders are the staple Link Attacks, tandem maneuvers that come in three flavors, Follow-Up Strike, Double Team Rush, and Full Party All-Out Assault. Despite being less flexible than Brave Orders, Link Attacks can be used to deal great damage and or to quickly stagger a number of foes. Issuing orders and performing advanced link attacks both cost BP, and BP is gained by dealing a critical strike to an enemy. Lots of little balancing tweaks have been made across the board. You can now equip multiple characters with the same sub-master quartz. The higher elements are now active across Erebonia rather than only in specific dungeon sections, so there's a much greater emphasis on arts. Breaking enemies now requires more effort, so you'll have to lean more heavily into crafts and link attacks to stagger foes. And Brave Orders have been nerfed quite significantly from their initial outing, though they're still plenty strong even in their basest forms. Cold Steel 4 also revives a lot of features seen in Cold Steel 2. Orbment slots must now be upgraded to equip higher level quartz, Brave Orders can be upgraded via trial chests, Cryptids and Lost Arts return, these Cryptid bosses are tough but they drop special quartz that grant what is essentially super magic, and specific battles have optional parameters that, if achieved, yield bonus AP. And some of the AP requirements are rather difficult, especially early in the game. The one thing that hasn't changed all too much is the Divine Knight battles. You still target specific limbs to create combination attack opportunities, and you still use some limited link skills. It's a simple enough system, and it wasn't broken in any way, so it's still pretty good. The scope and scale of these encounters has been increased, with more foes and allies engaging in battle simultaneously, plus a larger variety of enemies to face. But I am a bit disappointed that the Divine Knight battles haven't received the same upkeep and revisions as standard combat. Mecha combat is definitely secondary to the core gameplay, and it shows with how static these encounters have remained over the past four games. 
I still like it just fine. I just wanted to see one or two mechanics improved in some impactful way. Social gameplay is also fundamentally the same as in Cold Steel 3. You'll occasionally be given some free time to spend with various characters and improve your relationships, and you can also give gifts to achieve the same effect. Social link levels still grow independently of your combat link levels, much like in Cold Steel 3. Again, I do miss the interconnected system of Cold Steel 1 and 2, but this system is still good in its own way. And of course, there are the obligatory side activities. Vantage Masters returns and is just as awesome as before, and you can even re-battle people on higher difficulty settings for extra U material. But Cold Steel 4 also inexplicably adds a Puyo Puyo clone called Pom Pom, which also yields U material for winning. I can't say I was expecting a Puyo Puyo minigame, but I'm not complaining one bit. I definitely spent way too much time playing both of these. Ultimately, Cold Steel 4's gameplay is much like its story. A culmination of the titles that came before it, cherry-picking the best and most interesting bits from each predecessor, and implementing them in a thoughtful, purposeful manner. The core mechanics have been rebalanced, some old mechanics have been revived, and they work super well together for the most part. I would argue that Cold Steel 4's gameplay is the tightest the series has ever been. As always, the combat continues to impress me, standing head and shoulders above everything else, save for the story. If I had any advice for prospective players of this finale, I'd say get a really good grasp on arts this time around. They are way more important in 4 than they are in any prior installment. I'm sure this won't surprise anybody, but I absolutely love Cold Steel 4. It is, after all, a Trails game specifically tailored for fans like me. The story is rife with details and scenarios that reward series loyalists. It's certainly a bold move to chain together nine major JRPGs like this, rather than creating standalone entries like Final Fantasy or Persona. I can see Cold Steel 4 being quite alienating for anyone that lacks a thorough knowledge of the series at large, such as if they've only played the Cold Steel games. Several characters and relationships just exist, with no deeper explanation within Cold Steel 4, and the references and callbacks run deep, even by hardcore fan standards. Personally, I'd like to believe these things enrich the experience of Cold Steel 4. The prior relationships and individual plot threads give the world and its historical events a tangible quality. In a weird way, I think it makes Zemiria feel more believable, like a place that exists regardless of the player, rather than a setting that merely waits for the main character to arrive. That, in turn, instills a sense of urgency to the player's goals. These events are going to happen whether you're there to stop them or not, so you'd better bring the fight. That, in and of itself, has always been the series' most daunting barrier, as well as its biggest strength. Boldly, unapologetic, long-term storytelling. And nowhere has this been more evident than in Trails of Cold Steel 4. It's been a hell of a journey, but I'm glad I saw it through. Now I can set my eyes to the future to a trail of new beginnings. The Legend of Heroes Trails of Cold Steel 4 earns a 9.5 out of 10. If you love Trails of Cold Steel, please check out my dedicated Neon Falcom playlist and videos annotated on screen. As always, please subscribe and hit the bell to get updates whenever I post new content. Thank you so much.